Hi, this is a presentation on Sullivan's Interpersonal Theory of Personality Development. Uh, this is a detailed presentation which talks about uh, dynamisms and the level of cognitions in Sullivan's theory and also the personifications. So let's begin this presentation by talking about the theorist himself. So Sullivan's full name was Harry Stack Sullivan, and he was the first American to develop a comprehensive personality theory. Uh, he was of Irish origin, and he was born in a small farming community in Upper New York State in 1892. He was an only child of his parents, so that's why he was kind of socially immature and isolated child. So since Sullivan was an only child, as a young boy, he did not have any friends of his age, but he did have a lot of imaginary playmates. At school, uh, he was bullied and made fun of because of his Irish origin and also because he was quick-minded. And because of this, he was really unpopular among schoolmates. So this led to making him an isolated child. And then at the age of eight and a half, he experienced an intimate relationship with a 13-year-old boy. And this relationship transformed his life and also played an important role in the theory developed by him. The two boys, Sullivan and his friend, uh, they remained unpopular with other children. But on the contrast, they developed a very close bond with each other. So most scholars, um, that is Alexander, Chapman, and Havens, they believe that the relationship between these two boys, that is uh, Sullivan and Clarence Bellinger, was at least in some ways homosexual. But there were other scholars who believed the exact opposite, like Perry. He believed that the two boys were never sexually intimate. So the important question here is why do we want to know about Sullivan's sexual orientation? So this knowledge is important for at least um, two reasons. The first is as a personality theorist, uh, his early life history, including gender, birth order, religious beliefs, ethnic background, schooling, as well as sexual orientation all relate to that person's adult beliefs conception of humanity and the type of personality theory that the person will develop. So like in the previous presentation, we talked about Eric Erickson and we also uh, studied how his childhood affected the theory which he developed. The same thing happened with Harry Stack Sullivan and here in his theory, he actually believed that the interpersonal relationships are more important in formation of personality rather than the intrapsychic ones. And he might have come to the conclusion um, about the importance of interpersonal relationship is because of his own problems and because of his own struggles with developing an interpersonal relationship with others. Now the second important point which we should know that is based on his sexual orientation is that um, in Sullivan's case his sexual orientation may have prevented him from gaining the acceptance and the recognition he might have had if others had not suspected that he was homosexual. So you all might know that in the time when Sullivan was young, homosexuality was looked very down upon. The people who were homosexual, they were ridiculed and they were not accepted in the society. So Sullivan had to go through uh, the same struggle uh, in his early life. In 1976, Chapman argued that Sullivan's influence is pervasive yet unrecognized largely because many psychologists and psychiatrists of his day had difficulty accepting the theoretical concepts and therapeutic practices of someone they suspected of being homosexual.
So Chapman believed that Sullivan's contemporaries might have easily accepted a homosexual artist or a homosexual musician or even a homosexual writer. But when it came to accepting a psychiatrist who, were hom who was homosexual, they were still guided by the concept physician heal thyself because they thought homosexuality was a disease and which needed treatment. The phrase physician heal thyself was so ingrained in the American society during Sullivan's time that mental health workers found it very difficult to admit their indebtedness to a psychiatrist whose homosexuality was commonly known. They were ashamed of being treated by someone who was homosexual because homosexuality itself was considered as a disease and how can someone who was um, going through such a disease could treat someone else's disease. Thus Sullivan, who otherwise might have achieved greater fame, was shackled by the sexual prejudices that kept him from being regarded as America's foremost psychiatrist on the first half of the 20th century. So now let's move on to the interpersonal theory of personality development since we have talked in detail about Sullivan and his uh, sexual orientation and how it played an important role in the development of this interpersonal theory. So Sullivan is credited with developing the most comprehensive and understandable theory of interpersonal relations. He believed that the essence of being human is the capacity to live effectively in relationships with others. Freud's theory as well as social psychology and anthropology greatly influenced Sullivan's thinking about development. So we all know that all these personality development theories were somewhat or somehow um, based on Freud's theory. So Sullivan was also influenced greatly by Freud. So Sullivan believed the individual is a social being and personality development is determined within the context of interactions with other humans. He recognized the influence of the person's biological system on development to the extent that the body is necessary for life. However, he believed society influences the individual's biological functions. A central theme of Sullivan's theory is anxiety and its relationship to the formation of personality. So in his theory, anxiety um, is very important and he viewed anxiety as a prime motivator of behavior. He said that anxiety was a builder of self-esteem and also anxiety was the great educator in life. So as we talked earlier, uh, in keeping with his basic beliefs about the individual, Sullivan viewed the personality as consisting of interpersonal experiences ra rather than intrapsychic ones. Sullivan also talked about self-system. So the self-system is a significant aspect of the personality that develops in response to anxiety. Disapproving and forbidding gestures uh, during interactions with significant others help develop the self system. In response to these, these gestures, security operations become a part of self system to help the individual avoid or minimize anxiety. So as we all know that all of us always seek validation from someone else, our goal of life is to be validated, is to be uh, approved. So if there is any interaction which gives us anxiety, and if there is dis disapproval and there are forbidding gestures from significant others, then the person will develop a self system and this self system conforms with whatever the other person or the significant other is expecting from you and thereby it reduces anxiety. So as we talked earlier, whenever there is disapproval, the person develops security operations and these security operations become an important part of self system. So there are certain major types of um, security operations and these are sublimation, selective inattention and dissociation. So sublimation, it is an unconscious process of substituting a socially acceptable activity pattern to partially satisfy a need for an activity that would give rise to anxiety. For example, a person who likes violent behavior uh, but is 
but the thought of being violent gives him anxiety because violence is something which is not approved by the society or also by um, our family. So what the person does is he went, he goes and he joins army where he's able to express his violence, but for a, a positive cause or in a positive way. So this helps to reduce the anxiety and also it helps in self preservation. The second security operation is selective inattention. So it's an unconscious substitutive process that allows many meaningful details of one's life that are associated with anxiety go unnoticed. So Levan believed that selective inattention causes individuals to fail to profit from experiences related to problem areas. So many a times uh, if there is a situation which gives anxiety to a person, the person might unintentionally um, become inattentive to the whole situation. Uh, or this can also happen when you want to ignore something which is unimportant to you. For example, if you're in a party and there are a lot of people, you automatically um, listen to just one person who is talking to you while ignoring all the others or maybe you are in a loud room where everyone is uh, talking and you have to answer a phone call. So you answer the phone call and you become um, inattentive to all the other conversations happening around you. Dissociation is a third security operation and it is a system of processes that minimize or avoids anxiety by keeping parts of individual's experience called not me out of consciousness. So mild dissociation can be where a person is daydreaming or a person is getting lost in a movie or in a book or something like highway hypnosis. But there can be more uh, severe form of dissociation where a person becomes dissociated with his surroundings and also with his feelings and emotions and this might require treatment. So here the person is avoiding everything which he does not believe him to be a part of out of his consciousness. So now that we have talked about the security operation, let's talk about personality being an energy system. So Sullivan conceptualized personality as an energy system with the energy existing either as tension, that is potentiality for action, or as energy transformation, that is the action themselves. So tension is when you think about doing something and energy transformation is when you actually do that thing. So he further divided tensions into needs and anxiety. Needs. So satisfaction of needs is the fulfillment of all requirements associated with an individual's psychochemical environment. That is oxygen, food, water, warmth, tenderness, rest, activity, sexual expression, or virtually anything that when absent produces discomfort in an individual. While anxiety is a feeling of emotional discomfort toward the relief or prevention of which all behavior associated with an individual's psychochemical environment. So the basic goal of a human is to avoid anxiety at all cost. So all infants learn to be anxious through the empathic relationship that they have with their mothering one. So Sullivan called anxiety the chief disruptive force in interpersonal relationship. So he believed that anxiety is not only the chief disruptive force in the interpersonal relations, but also the main factor in the development of one's inability to satisfy needs or to achieve interpersonal security or empathy. So a state where anxiety is completely absent and all the tensions are absent, that particular state is called euphoria. So Levan believed that anxiety has its origin in early life interactions with its primary caretaker or the mothering one. He proposed that the tension of anxiety when present in the mothering one induces anxiety in the infant. Interpersonal security. So it is the feeling associated with relief from anxiety. 
when all needs have been met one experiences a sense of total well-being which Suleiman termed as interpersonal security so he believed that individuals have an innate need for interpersonal security now let's talk about dynamisms of Harry's Dax Sullivan. So Sullivan used the term uh, dynamism to refer to a typical pattern of behavior. Dynamisms may relate either to specific zones of the body or to tensions. So the first dynamism in Sullivan's theory is mal malevolence. The disjunctive dynamism of evil and hatred is called malevolence. So it was defined by Sullivan as a feeling of living among one's enemies. Those children who become malevolent have much difficulty giving and receiving tenderness or being intimate with other people. So the second dynamism is intimacy. The conjunctive dynamism marked by a close personal relationship between two people of equal status is called intimacy. Intimacy facilitates interpersonal development while decreasing both anxiety and loneliness. So in one way you can understand that intimacy is the exact opposite of malevolence. The third dynamism is lust. In contrast to both malevolence and intimacy, lust is an isolating dynamism. That is, lust is a self-centered need that can be satisfied in the absence of an intimate personal relationship. In other words, although intimacy presupposes tenderness or love, lust is based solely on sexual gratification and requires no other person for its satisfaction or it does not require an intimate interpersonal relationship for its satisfaction. The third dynamism is self-system. So we talked about self-system in the previous slides and self-system is the most inclusive of all dynamisms or it is the pattern of behaviors that protects us from anxiety and maintains our interpersonal security. The self-system is a conjunctive dynamism but because its primary job is to protect the self from anxiety, it tends to stifle personality change. So as we talked earlier, to protect or preserve the self-system, the individual can have security operations and those security operations were selective inattention, um, sublimation and dissociation. So along with the security operations, there are two main strategies through which uh, the self-system avoids the system of anxiety. The first and the more obvious one is to avoid what one anticipates leads to disapproval of significant others. So avoiding everything which can lead to disharmony or disapproval from others. And the second one is to do what one believes will win their approval or trying to be a people pleaser. So those were the dynamisms in Sullivan's theory. Now let's talk about personifications in uh, Sullivan's theory. So Sullivan believed that people acquire certain images of self and others throughout the developmental stages and he referred to these subjective perceptions as personifications. So these are the subjective ideas what a person has about their significant others and these are called as personifications. So the first personification is bad mother, good mother. The bad mother personification grows out of infants' experiences with a nipple that does not satisfy their hunger needs. All infants experience the bad mother personification even though their real mothers may be loving and nurturing. Later, infants acquire a good mother personification as they become mature enough to recognize the tender and cooperative behavior of their mothering one. Still later, these two personifications combine to form a contrasting image of the real mother. So it's kind of a love-hate relationship. So the second personification is me personification. So during infancy, children acquire three me personifications. The first one is bad me, the second one is good me, and the third one is not me. So the bad me grows from experiences of punishment and dis disapproval. The good me results from experiences with reward and approval and the not me is something which allows a person to dissociate or to selectively not attend to experiences that is related to anxiety.
eideric personifications. So one of the Sullivan's most interesting observation was that people often create imaginary traits that they project onto others. So included in these eidetic personifications are the imaginary playmates that preschool aged children often have. So these imaginary friends enable children to have a safe, secure relationship with other person, even though that person is imaginary. So as we talked about uh, the childhood of Sullivan, we learned that he had a lot of imaginary friends. So he implemented this in his theory. So now let's talk about the cognitive process or the levels of cognition in this theory. So let's talk about the stages of development in interpersonal theory. So similar to Freud and Eric Erikson and some of the other psychologists, Sullivan also saw interpersonal development as taking place over seven stages, that is from infancy to mature adulthood. Personality changes are most likely during transition between a stages. So if you remember Eric Erikson's in Eric Erikson's theory, the development happens from the birth till the death of a person. But here in Sullivan's theory, it's from infancy to mature adulthood. So the emergence of syntactic language means where the child starts uh, forming proper meaningful sentences. So prototaxic um, cognition is the undifferentiated thought that is unable to separate the whole into parts or that is unable to use symbols while parataxic mode sees events as casually related because of temporal or serial connections in the absence of logical relationship uh, in, in infancy there is also a learning of coordinated movements uh, which involve hands and eyes, hand and mouth, and ear and voice. Infancy is the time when the child receives tenderness from the mothering one while also learning anxiety through an empathic linkage with the mother. Anxiety may increase to the point of terror, but such terror is controlled by the built-in protection of apathy and somnolent detachment that allows the baby to go to sleep. As we talked earlier, during infancy, the children use an autistic language which takes place on a prototaxic or parataxic level. The next stage is childhood. So the transition from infancy to childhood is made possible by the learning of language and the organization of experience into a syntactic mode. So childhood extends from the emergence of articulate speech to appearance of the need for playmate. So here the child is able to make sentences and also needs playmates. So the pr a child's primary interpersonal relationship continues to be with the mother. Uh, now the mother is differentiated from other persons who nurture the child. The third stage after infancy and childhood is the juvenile era. The juvenile stage begins with the need for peers of equal status and continues until the child develops a need for an intimate relationship. It extends throughout the most of the school years. One acquires social subordination to authority figure outside family. At this time, children should also learn how to compete, to compromise, and to cooperate. The fourth stage is a pre-adolescence. It is perhaps the most crucial stage because mistakes made earlier can be corrected during pre-adolescence, but errors made during pre-adolescence are nearly impossible to overcome in later life. Pre-adolescence spans uh, the time from the need for a single best friend until puberty. Children who do not learn intimacy during pre-adolescence have added difficulties relating to potential sexual partners during later stages. After pre-adolescence comes early adolescence. So with puberty comes the lust dynamism and the beginning of early adolescence. So development during this stage is ordinarily marked by a coexistence of intimacy with a single friend of the same gender and sexual interest in many persons of the opposite gender. The physiological changes of puberty are experienced by the youth as feelings of lust. Out of these feelings, the lust dynamism emerges and begins to assert itself in the personality. 
So there is a separation of erotic need from the need of, for intimacy. The erotic need takes as its object a member of the opposite sex while the need for intimacy remains fixated upon a member of the same sex. However, if children have no pre-existing capacity for intimacy, they may confuse lust with love and develop sexual relationships that are devoid of true intimacy. So these were the six stages of uh, in Suleiman's theory. So let's review all these stages. So the first stage was infancy uh, and the main characteristic in infancy is the gratification of needs. The second stage was childhood where uh, there is delayed gratification. And the third uh, stage was juvenile era where there was formation of peer groups and the need for friends or playmates. Pre-adolescence was the time where the child develops relationship within the same gender. Early adolescence was where the child strives to find out his identity, while late adolescence was a time where the person or the child was forming lasting intimate relationship. Critique of Sullivan's interpersonal theory. So Sullivan never systematized his concepts, so it seems all of it seems very scattered. His theory has a low ability to generate research. It requires a lot of insight and cognitive abilities to actually understand his theory. So it's kind of an acquired taste. It lacks an indicator to measure effectiveness and it's also hugely dependent on the clinic, clinician's own experience and expertise uh, for effectiveness. The theory does have a lot of limitations, but it also has application in nursing and also in, uh, in the practice of psychiatry. The interpersonal theory has significant relevance to nursing practice. So relationship development, which is a major concept of this theory, is a major psychiatric nursing intervention. So nurses develop therapeutic relationships with client in an effort to help them generalize this ability to interact successfully with others. So if the nurse has knowledge about the behaviors associated with all levels of anxiety and the methods of alleviating anxiety, it helps the nurse to assist clients achieve interpersonal security and a sense of well-being. So the nurses can use the concept of Sullivan's theory to help client achieve a higher degree of independent and interpersonal functioning. A pediatric nurse can assess developmental stages and tasks and uh, teach family about normal development and the development of self-system. She can also teach the families how to promote syntactic rather than parataxic mode of experiencing uh, through intervention. Uh, the nurse can also help promote positive experience for clients so that good me or positive self-concept can develop. So Levant's interpersonal theory provides the theoretical basis for interpersonal uh, psychotherapy for depression and schizophrenia. This theory can also help uh, clinicians to treat a lot of psychiatric disorders. The first one is anxiety disorder. So anxiety disorder comprises of the anxiety component which is associated with cautious and avoidant behaviors to anticipated threats. So by exploring Sullivan's not me self concept which is associated with intense anxiety, the therapist will be able to understand the related thoughts and beliefs. The second is depressive disorders. So the distinguish, uh, distinguishing factors of depressive disorders are the presence of the constant, sad, empty, irritable mood. So Sullivan's concept of the need for satisfaction, which includes the physical, emotional, and the physiological factors which are necessary and are important for an individual's general well-being, helps to understand the causes of depressive disorders as well eating disorders and obsessive compulsive disorders. So this has a detrimental effect on the psychosocial and the physical elements of an individual. So obsessive compulsive disorders are distinguished by intrusive preoccupation and repeated behaviors. So it can be said that both types of disorder consist of a compulsive element in which they are impelled to compete to complete certain tasks or sets of behaviors. So Sullivan's bad me and good me concepts are helpful to understand this in which individuals try to avoid the disciplinary outcomes through controlling aspects of their lives and in 
the other in which the goal for individuals is to gain approval.